It's both an honor and pleasure for me to introduce our second lecturer this afternoon, Dr. Ben Witherington III. Dr. Witherington holds degrees from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, he would have me tell you, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and the University of Durham in England. Of course, not Durham in North Carolina. That would be bad for a Tar Heel. <laughs> Dr. Witherington is the Amos Professor of Doctoral Studies at Asbury Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. Ben tells me that his post is also known as the Aflac Professor of New Testament <laughs> because I gather that it's Aflac money that made his chair a reality. Ben also serves on the doctoral faculty at the University of St. Andrews in St. Andrews, Scotland. It is a daunting task to introduce someone of such stature and standing. Ben told me to be brief, I'll do my best. Succinctly put, uh, my friend Ben Witherington is a prolific author, some 50 books, some of us have read 50 books, he's written 50 books, and scores of articles. He's also a tremendous teacher and is much sought after as a lecturer, preacher, teacher, and guide to all sorts and sundries of sites and destinations and holy lands. I regard Ben to be what F.F. F. Bruce and I. Howard Marshall once were, namely, the Dean of Evangelical Biblical Scholars. When I think of Ben, and I do so a good bit these days in that we are working on a three-volume collection of yet-to-be-published notes and lectures by the Cambridge professor latterly, uh, Bishop of uh, Durham, J.B. Lightfoot, so I think of him a lot, three things spring to mind. One, unfathomable productivity. For example, Ben has written a commentary on every New Testament document. It must do his Methodist heart good to have bested John Calvin on this score. <laughs> See? Uncommon magnanimity. Ben not only possesses a keen mind, but also a sweet heart. He is kind to friend and foe alike. Read his work. It is fair even-handed, generous in spirit. He is both a gentleman and a scholar. And thirdly, remarkable creativity. The range of Ben's ex experience, expertise, suggests a fertile mind and imagination. This afternoon, we will be treated to a lecture, Joanna Junia, the story of a woman apostle. Please join me in welcoming Ben Witherington. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Raymond Brown once came and gave a series of lectures at Asbury and uh, got up and said, if you believe what the introducer has said about the speaker and you are the speaker, you are finished. <laughs> One of my favorite characters in English literature of the 19th and 20th century is Sherlock Holmes. And one of the things Sherlock is regularly saying to his good friend, Dr. Watson, John Watson then, Joan Watson now, <laughs> is Watson, you see, but you do not observe. One of the problems with the language about women in the New Testament is that we're used to seeing what we see, but we don't always observe the significance of what we're seeing. And one of the cases where this is certainly true is in the story of Joanna and the story of Junia. Let's talk about the beginnings of the story. And I'd like to read for you just a biblical text. I hear that's an appropriate thing to do at Baylor. <laughs> this is Luke 8, 1 through 3. Listen closely. Here's what Luke says. Now after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women 
who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who was the manager of Herod's household, or another reading would be Herod's estate, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Thus far, Luke 8, 1 through 3. Joanna is introduced in this text, as is Mary Magdalene, for the first time. Um, Mary Magdalene is not introduced in Luke 7, 36 through 50, where it's an anonymous woman, a sinner woman, who comes and anoints Jesus' feet. So this is the first time we hear about these characters in the Lucan narrative. And what is said about Joanna is that she is a high-status woman, that her husband has a very important job, and that she has become a patroness of the mission of Jesus, quote, who provided for them out of their own resources. Now, this is extraordinary in many ways because women basically in early Jewish society were not allowed to have property. They were property. Marriage agreements in early Judaism were, in fact, property agreements, and they were arranged marriages as well. Whatever the case is with Joanna, she's married to a man named Chusa, who is Herod's estate manager. Now, what is most remarkable about this story is that Jesus himself has female followers. I can see the Galilean Gazette now. Radical rabbi on the road again with both the 12 and women he's not related to. Oy vey, news at 11. <laughs> this is a radical move. If you read early Jewish literature, A, you do not find female disciples. B, you do not find men traveling with women they're not related to. C, you even have warnings and injunctions not to talk with women that you're not known to, related to, the neighbor of, etc. Well, Joanna was not from Nazareth. She undoubtedly lived in Tiberias with her husband, Chusa, and this man was very important to Herod, the ruler of Galilee, Herod Antipas. What happens when a wife of a Herodian employee, remembering that Herod beheaded the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptizer, no, he should not be called John the Baptist. There weren't denominations back then. <laughs> John the Baptizer. What happens when a wife of a Herodian employee goes walkabout with a Galilean prophet whose cousin was beheaded by Herod? Well, here's what happens. Imagine a conversation between Herod and the runner of his whole estate where he says to Chusa, Chusa? I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. You got to choose. Over here is your job. Over here is your wife. What would have happened is that she would have been given a writ of divorce if she continued to follow Jesus. And what we know about the continuation of the story is that she is one of those women, according to St. Luke, who is last at the cross, first at the tomb, and first to see the risen Jesus. Her following Jesus did not cease in Galilee. During the Galilean ministry, she followed Jesus during his last trip up to Jerusalem, and only Luke mentions her in his gospel. Two texts, Luke 23, 49, are of importance. Here are the text. But all those who knew him including the women who had followed him from Galilee. Not just followed him in Galilee, but followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching the crucifixion. Luke 23, 49. And then immediately after that, in verse 55, we are told who these women are. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph of Arimathea and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they went home to prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandments. If you turn to chapter 24, 
and verse 10, we then hear this identification. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who went and told the apostles what they had found at the tomb. Now, one of the interesting things to do is look at the early iconography of women in early Christianity. Uh, here is a Russian Orthodox icon of Joanna. And you'll notice what she has in her hand. She's got a vase of myrrh. So she's being depicted as one of the women who went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. Here's another one. Again, this time she's got a more garish vase with two handles, and she's called Saint Joanna, the myrrh bearer. Myrrh was wrapped in the winding sheet of a corpse to retard the odor because Jerusalem in the summer was rather like Waco in the summer, and people would be visiting the tomb for at least a week thereafter. The normal Jewish grieving or mourning period went on for a whole week. There is even a Joanna religious festival to this day in Latin American countries, and now she's dressed up like Queen Mary as a queen who is celebrated in art and in festival in Latin American Catholic countries. Here's another picture of her uh, dressed up in her best party dress with her Miss Peru sash on as well. What should we say about this story? Listen to Luke's record of what happened. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Remember how he told y'all while he was still with you in Galilee. Now this is a crucial verse because it means that the angels got the memo that these women were disciples of Jesus in Galilee and he had instructed them about his coming death, burial, and resurrection. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then, it says, they remembered his words. This in Luke's narrative and in Acts as well is the operative word used most frequently for disciples in relationship to the teaching of their teacher. And when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 men and the other men that were with them. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. If we were to go on with the story, we have the reaction of the men, which was, and they thought it was an old wives' tale. Luke 24, 11. But these words seemed to them an old wives' tale, and the men didn't believe them. And then in later in chapter 24, we have these words. They came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see, nor did they see any angels. Now, it's advisable to compare this account of the Easter Sunday morning events and the chaos that ensued to the one in John. A very similar story is told. The women find the tomb. They do not find the body of Jesus. They go off to tell the disciples. Peter and the beloved disciple come running to the tomb. They 
also see that the tomb is entry, empty. But notice in the Lucan account and the Johannine account, the women see angels, the men see nada. The only persons who have an encounter with the supernatural at the tomb are the women. Not only is that the case, but in John 20, as the story goes on, Mary Magdalene is the first person to encounter Jesus himself. Later in the story, on the road to Emmaus, which is where Luke 24, 23 comes into play, Jesus rebukes the two on the road to Emmaus with these words, who have reported to him that Jesus was not found. How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Now you have to ask the question, was Jesus just referring to the Old Testament prophets or is he referring to the women who came and accurately reported what they had seen at the empty tomb and of the risen Jesus? In any case, the Emmaus walk retreat proved to be a revelation to these two, but not before the breaking of the bread. Here is a apparently different saint, Saint Junia. And notice what it says, Saint Junia the Apostle. Now, a little what's in a name. Junia is the direct Latin equivalent of the Hebrew name Joanna. Let me say that again. Junia is the Latin equivalent of the female Hebrew name Joanna. So if we ask the question, what happened to Joanna after the Easter events, I think we actually have an answer. Matthew 28 and John 20 are clear enough that the women were first to see the risen Lord, and this would include Joanna, who had already seen the empty tomb and encountered angels. Now, since Joanna had continued to follow Jesus, not just in Galilee, but from Galilee to Jerusalem, which was a huge no-no in this culture, if you had a husband, especially a husband that worked for Herod Antipas. She did this in disobedience to her husband and to his boss, probably. I think it's very likely that by the time we get to Easter, she is divorced. She is now, again, a single woman, handed a writ of divorce, and traveling with Jesus and the disciples anywhere and everywhere. Now, this brings us to Romans 16, 7, which we must unpack very carefully. It says this, Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kin, who were in prison with me. They are noteworthy, prominent, amongst the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Paul wrote this in about A.D. 57, 58 A.D., or about 28, 27 years after the crucifixion. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kin, who were in prison with me. They are noteworthy, prominent amongst the apostles. Notice that it doesn't say noteworthy to the apostles, which would distinguish them from the apostles. It says prominent amongst the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Now, let's unpack this phrase by phrase. My kinsmen, this could mean something as close as they are my cousins, but it certainly means these are my fellow Jews. A second phrase of cruciality, they were in Christ before me. Now I'm gonna let that sink in for a minute. That is, they became followers of Jesus before Paul did, who was converted in about AD 34 or 35 maybe even a little earlier than that, depending on how you read the evidence in Acts and in Galatians 1 and 2. So where would they have had to be to be in Christ before Paul? 
Answer, Jerusalem, Judea, perhaps Galilee. Then he says something even more remarkable. They were in prison with me. Now, women in the Greco-Roman world were only incarcerated if they had somehow made themselves a public nuisance. Paul is saying that these are two of his co-workers who got jail time with him for proclaiming the good news. The only way a woman gets in jail is if she makes a public nuisance of herself by saying something or doing something in public. Now, why Junia here rather than the Hebrew name Joanna? As I said, Junia is the Latin form of the name. But let me stress to you that Junia is named after a female deity. Perhaps you've heard of the female deity. There are no Roman male names, Junias. You don't name Roman males in a macho culture after a female deity. You just don't go there. That's like a boy named Sue. It doesn't work, okay? So, when we read the text in the Greek, and we hear about Andronicus and this other person, there had been speculation before the early Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, and afterwards, that maybe this was two males. Surely it can't be a man and a woman, because we know for a fact, beware of anybody who says we know, that there were no female apostles. Now you see, in the accusative case, in this case, the female name would look the same as the male name if there was a male name. But if you actually do your homework and look through the Latin lexicons and look through Ibicus and do a complete word search, you will discover that there are no Romans who are men named Junias anywhere in Latin literature before, during, or after the time of Paul. Zero percent of the representations of this name in ancient literature refer to men. Ergo, she's a woman. And what we have here is a husband and wife team like Priscilla and Aquila. Why would Paul call her Junia here rather than Joanna? Well, who's the audience of the letter to the Romans? Da, 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 da. Romans, who spoke what language? Latin, and called people by their Latin names. Paul would use the Latin form of the name when writing to Rome, of course, if there was such a form. Now, what about Andronicus? I would suggest he was an early Christian who, after Easter, married Junia. Also, Already, we were told, an early convert to Christianity, like Junia. We do not know his proper name because Andronicus is not a proper Latin name. It's a nickname. It means something like manly man, buff dude, something like that. It comes from the word andros, male. So we don't know his proper name. Whatever his proper name is, He's married to Junia in all likelihood. Now, I want to stress this point more than all the others. This does not say noteworthy to the apostles. This is an artful dodge in some translations by people like Wayne Grudem and others. It does not work. The Greek really won't allow such a translation. And the reason it's translated that way is those who did the translating couldn't possibly imagine a female apostle. Now, Paul's criteria for being an apostle is in play here because, of course, it is Paul who is speaking here. Criteria number one for being an apostle in Paul's eyes is you have to have seen the risen Lord. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1, he says, quote, am I not an apostle? What's the very next sentence? The next rhetorical question is, have I not seen the risen Lord? 
Apostle with a capital A is someone who has seen the risen Lord. So embedded in this text itself, by calling Andronicus and Junia apostles, is the implied truth they have seen the risen Lord and, like Paul himself, been commissioned by him. But Paul was the last one to meet this criteria of having seen the risen Lord, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, add up the data. Where would Junia have been converted? Where she saw the risen Lord. Which was where? In the Holy Land. She is in Christ before Paul, an early convert before the Gentile mission, a Jew, Paul's kinsman from the Holy Land, prominent, noteworthy, famous, one of the first apostles and famous. Why famous? Jesus appeared, according to 1 Corinthians 15, to hundreds of people. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, to 500 at one time, it says in its list of those to whom Jesus appeared. So why famous? Famous because she, unlike many others, unlike Paul himself, was one of the original followers of Jesus in Galilee and in Judea. In a sense, Joanna Junia is the female equivalent of Peter. She spans the ministry of Jesus and the beginnings of the early church. Indeed, I would tell you that there are only two disciples about whom we have a story from before, during the ministry of Jesus, through the ministry of Jesus, to the death and resurrection of Jesus, to the appearances of Jesus, and into the life of the early church. The only two figures that we have anything like a thumbnail biography for that span that whole arc from the ministry of Jesus to the rise of the early church are two apostles. One is male, Peter. The other is female, Junia. Somewhere between Easter and 57 AD, this woman had gotten married, met Paul, and she and her husband had become Pauline co-workers like Priscilla and Aquila. And at some point, somewhere other than Rome, they had been incarcerated with Paul. But where are they now when Romans 16, 7 is written? Paul says, greet them. So ergo, where are they? They're in Rome, not with Paul. But when Romans 16, 7 is written, Junia is in Rome and greeted by Paul. Now, this is the best I could do to find an image of Junia and her husband, Andronicus. And sorry, it's not a better image than this, but it's the only iconic image I know of. Let's talk about the implications of this. Let's start from backwards and work forwards. Let's say it's true that Joanna is an apostle. One person might say, ah, but there are apostles with a capital A, and there are apostles with a little a, and the apostles with a little a are just missionaries. And of course, it's okay for women to go to the mission field and teach and preach there. They just can't do it here in my home church. The problem with that is that when Paul wants to talk about apostles of churches, which he does in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, they are called, wait for it, apostles of churches. They are not simply called noteworthy amongst the apostles, full stop. It is not said of them that they are prominent amongst all the apostles. It is simply said they are apostles of churches. So, no, without a qualifier in Romans 16, 7, we cannot assume and we should not assert that they are simply missionaries from a local church. Why would Paul give them a fourfold credit reference in a letter like this 
if they were just another missionary of a local church. That's very unlikely. The burden of proof would have to be on those who want to argue that case. Second point, they've been at this a while. It's 57 AD, they've been Paul's co-workers, and two things have happened. A, they've had jail time. B, so there, you know, you can see the poster in the post office in Philippi. Philippi is most wanted, Andronicus and Junia. They've had jail time, and they have done enough work to be what? Noteworthy, prominent, famous amongst the apostles. You get the impression they've been at this not just for years, but for decades. Now this makes very good sense if Junia is in fact Joanna. She's been at it from the beginning, from the ministry in Galilee, and had even financially supported Jesus during his Galilean ministry. Let's work backwards from there. If there were women apostles who proclaimed the word of God and taught, as is said about Priscilla and Aquila, we are told in Acts 18, 26 that Priscilla and Aquila taught a famous male leader, Apollos, more accurately the way of the Lord, thus far Acts 18, 26. If women were proclaiming the word and teaching and even teaching Shakhara men, then we need to move backwards another step and say, well, maybe those texts in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 don't mean what I have been told they mean. What do those texts mean? So turn with me, if you want, to those texts, and we'll talk about them just briefly. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 36, just for a minute. Just to refresh your memory, I will read it to you. It says this, As in all the congregations of the Lord, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but they must be in submission, as the law says. Um, footnote, the law nowhere in the Old Testament, nowhere in the Mosaic law, is there a statement, women should be in submission to men. Indeed, there is not even a commandment, wives should be in submission to their husbands in the Mosaic law. More on that in a minute. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. It doesn't say in submission to some person. It says in submission. If they want to ask questions about something, they should ask their own husbands or men at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in this fashion in church. Now, a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. The context of this statement is everything that has come before in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14. And what is said in 1 Corinthians 11 is that women are allowed to pray and prophesy in the worship service. And by the way, the word prophesy includes teaching. That's 1 Corinthians 11. They're told they can do this as long as they cover their glory, which is their hair. The text says they must have exousia, authority, on their head. And so they do. But if we fast forward to 1 Corinthians 14, the context there is prophecy, speaking in tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And women are allowed to do that, as 1 Corinthians 11 says and suggests, just as men are. Ergo, this prohibition in 1 Corinthians 14, 32b to 36 has to be some kind of specific speech. And indeed, this text tells us what is prohibited. What is it? Asking questions. Worship should not be a Q&A session. 
Now, why would women be asking questions in worship? The answer is, that's what Greek and Roman women did when they went to oracles. Oracles in the Greco-Roman world were consultative services. They were like Sister Sadie, like a medium, like a tarot card reader. If you went up the mountain from Corinth to the oracle at Delphi, you came with your questions. You would ask the oracle, should I marry this man? You would ask the oracle, should I go to war against this power? And then after the oracle at Delphi, a woman had chewed the pyrocantha leaves and sat on the tripod and made strange and elaborate noises. The priest would come out of the Holy of Holies, the Sanctum Sanctorum, and say to those who were there, here is your answer. So for example, when King Agamemnon went to the oracle at Delphi and said, should I go to war against Persia? The answer came back, if you go to war against Persia, a great victory will be won. You'll notice the oracle didn't say by whom. <laughs> or when someone comes and says, should I marry this woman? The oracle comes back with, if you marry this woman, someone will be happy. Didn't say who. That's the kind of vague answers that you got. But the point is, in Greco-Roman prophecy, prophets and prophetesses were supposed to be asked questions. A very different model of prophecy than in the Jewish world. In the Jewish world, a prophet got a late word from God and said, thus saith Yahweh, and spoke the revelation that God had given them. They were not those who answered Q&A. They proclaimed the word of God. Paul is saying, during the time of the prophesying in Corinth, your view of what should go on there is in fact biblical prophecy, not the kind that you were used to in Corinth. Now, the second thing about this that is important about in the context is there are plenty of statements in the Old Testament that when worship is going on, God is in your midst and you're supposed to do what? Be silent in the presence of God. Especially you are supposed to be silent in the presence of the speaking of God's word. So when Paul says, it's appropriate for women to be silent when he has just previously said that when a prophet speaks, everyone else should be quiet and listen. He is simply elaborating on the theme from earlier in the chapter. He's not singing out, signaling out women for a universal ban of speaking in church. It has nothing to do with that. It's a situation-specific utterance requiring a certain kind of silence when God's word is being proclaimed. And yes, we have plenty of exhortations in the Old Testament. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth do what? Keep silence. This silence is not gender specific. It has to do with worship specific silence when God's word is being proclaimed. And this word just in, there are also exhortations about being in submission to the hearing of God's word. Nothing here about women being in submission to men. That's not what the Greek text says. Thus far, 1 Corinthians 14, but the real bait noir is 1 Timothy 2. So let's turn to 1 Timothy 2, and we will read it in context. Paul is instructing Timothy about how to have orderly worship, and he begins by telling people how they ought to pray. I'm going to begin with verse 8. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Now, as in 1 Corinthians 14, this is a corrective text, an abuse 
of proper speech and worship is being corrected in 1 Corinthians 14. An abuse of proper speech is being corrected in 1 Timothy 2. There's an old Latin adage, abusus non tolet usum. An abuse of a privilege does not rule out its proper use. When Paul corrects a woman who is speaking out of turn or inappropriately in worship, it doesn't mean he's banning her from speaking appropriately in worship. The same applies here, but you'll notice that Paul is an equal opportunity critiquer. He critiques the men first in verse 8 here. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearl or expensive clothes. Now we know exactly what he's talking about here. Uh, high status women had in Paul's day beehive hairdos in which they wove jewels to attract attention, of course. And I want you to picture an evening worship service in a home in a room full of lamps. In walks a woman with a beehive hairdo and jewels in her hair. She would look like a walking disco ball. <laughs> this is another reason for covering the hair, okay? What Paul wants is nothing, nothing that distracts from the worship of God in worship. In this case, he wants high-status women to dress without bling, to dress modestly and without bling that draws attention to them because it's not about them, nor is it about the men in worship. Then he says this, they should be adorned with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And then he says this, a woman should learn in quietness in full submission. Again, you'll notice that the phrase in full submission says nothing about husbands or men. Indeed, the phrase in full submission modifies the verb listen and learn. This is the appropriate posture of students to their teacher. They are to be quiet, they are to listen, and they are to learn. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. And then the Greek literally says this, the crucial verse 12. I am not now permitting a woman to teach or to usurp authority over a man. She must be hesukia, quiet. This is a different word than in 1 Corinthians 14, sigao, silent. This word here is quiet, two different words. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women shall be A, saved through childbearing, B, kept safe through childbearing, C, saved through the childbearing, if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, one thing I am absolutely sure about, about these last few verses, Paul did not believe in justification by grace through baby making. <laughs> so however you translate this last phrase, it should not be translated, and women shall be saved by childbearing. That's not Paul's theology, or even in this case, advice to Timothy. Second point, did you notice how I translated this? I am not now permitting does not mean I would never permit. It's present, continual tense, and in this context, it, if you do the research that Phil Payne did on this particular phrase, not once in all of Greek literature does the phrase, I am not now permitting, mean I would never permit. It doesn't mean that. It means on this occasion, in this situation, I am not now permitting. And what is he not permitting? He's not permitting these high status women that he has just referred to, to teach or even to authentain. Now this is a hapax legomena, that is a word that appears only once in all of the scriptures. In a corrective context, an abuse of authority. In a non-corrective context, 
It means a use of authority. Is this a corrective context? Yes, it is. He's already corrected the men about grumbling before praying. He's corrected women in regard to their dress and now in regard to teaching on this occasion in this place. He says, I am not now permitting women to teach and they shouldn't usurp authority over the existing teachers. And then he references the story of Adam and Eve. Now in this case, you need to know early Jewish exegesis of Genesis. The early rabbis were innocent of J, E, P, and D. They did not think there were two creation stories, but only one. They thought the second one that, that involves the story of both Adam and Eve um, was an amplification of the first one and simply a further specification of the first one. And when they read that story in the Hebrew, this is what they came up with. Fact number one, who received the commandment, thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Answer, only Adam. Go back and look at the text. Eve was not there. So whose job was it to tell Eve what exactly the Almighty had said in this matter? It was Adam's job to tell Eve, right? So when Eve has this little dialogue with the serpent at the tree, and she says, we're not even supposed to touch the fruit, etc., etc. How well do you think she had been instructed by Adam, asked the rabbis, and the rabbi said, not very well. And so when she took action on her own, what the rabbis said about this story was, she was usurping the authority of Adam, and she had not been instructed to have a close encounter of the first kind with the nefarious one. But on top of that, she turned around and instructed her husband about this matter. And he did take and he did eat. And then their eyes were opened. Now you see to the early rabbis, this story is about the usurping of authority. A woman who was not authorized to teach her husband about anything, a woman who was not authorized to take action unilaterally, did so. And you have to ask, where was Adam when all this was going on? Well, right there by his wife. She hands him the fruit of the tree, doesn't she? He's not somewhere far off, according to the rabbis. He's right there. What should have happened, according to the rabbis? Adam should have spoken up and said, I can't go for that. He should have said to her, neither should you. But that doesn't happen. So why has Paul referenced that story here? He's dealing with the case of the usurpation of genuine and legitimate authority. Some high status women in Ephesus apparently, who were, were assuming that since they had played prominent religious roles in pagan religion, they could begin to play prominent religious roles in the early Christian community as well without first being instructed. No, says Paul, if you go down that route without being properly instructed, if you don't learn before you teach, then you're no better than that story of power and teaching abuse in Adam and Eve's story. But he says, we have a remedy. And here's what he said the remedy was. He says, however, women shall be saved by the childbearing. There is a definite article before this participial noun form. Women shall be saved by the child. Which childbearing were women saved by? The childbearing that came through Mary, who reverses the curse brought about through Eve. Paul is doing biblical theology here. 
he says, as the curse came through a woman and by the man Adam, see Romans 5, 21 and following. So the curse is reversed through another woman, Mary. And women, as well as men, shall be saved through the childbearing, the coming of Jesus himself. A text without a context is just a pretext for what you want it to mean. Bottom line, there's nothing in this text that rules women out categorically from teaching or preaching or praying or prophesying, or being apostles, or being deacons, or being elders, or any other role the Holy Spirit decides he wants women, as well as men, to do. Because friends, the person who determines what spiritual ministries we're supposed to do is the Holy Spirit, an equal opportunity employer. And gender has nothing to do with it. Whereas gender roles affect some of the roles we play in the physical family, Paul is saying gender has nothing to do with the roles that we play in the family of faith. That's determined by who is gifted and called to do this role or that role. So one last time back to Joanna Junia. Could she really have been an apostle? Could she really have been a co-worker of Paul? Could she really have been incarcerated with Paul for the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus? Could she really have set an example of sacrificial giving to keep the ministry of Jesus himself going? Could she really have been prominent and celebrated and noteworthy amongst the apostles? Oh, yes. That's exactly what happened, and it is our turn to rise up and call her blessed. Thank you very much. If you need to excuse yourself to get to other appointments, this is the time to do it. Uh, if not, uh, Dr. Witherington has graciously agreed to take five or ten minutes worth of questions. And so if you would like to ask Dr. Witherington a question, please raise your hand and do so. Yes, ma'am. Has anyone ever suggested that Andronicus is Andrew? Is it the same group thing? Yes, no. Um, you're right. But Andrew was a very common Hellenistic name. And Andronicus is clearly a slave name. We have lots of evidence that Andronicus is a slave name. It's not a proper name, it's a nickname. Um, Andrew is a proper name, Andronicus not so much. Yes, ma'am. Joanna, having been the wife and the steward of Herod, yep. also been a Roman citizen? Not necessarily, um, no. Uh, Herod, of course, himself was not a Roman citizen, and so not, not necessarily. Paul certainly was. But I, I doubt uh, that Chusa was. He was simply a Galilean Jew, and so was Joanna. But they were so, of, of pretty elite social status. You don't get a job without that, without a pretty good credit reference. Well, when he divorced her, yeah. I'm, I'm not a historian. Yes. Um, would he have had to have given her back her dowry later? No. Like no, but he would have to give her a writ of divorce. Okay. You see, if, if she's guilty of uh, bad behavior, you don't have to give the money back. So, I don't think that really bothered her. She must have had independent resources. Well, that was one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that really bothered her. But what I want you to understand is that early Christianity, and indeed the Jesus movement, were countercultural. They were radical in their own day. Now, to us, the idea of women disciples will be every church has got more of those than it does men disciples. We already know this story, sing us a different song. But in antiquity, this is something radical. I mean, I did my doctoral thesis on women in the New Testament. And let me tell you, I looked high and low for evidence of women being disciples of early Jewish teachers, rabbis, sages, whatever. There is no such evidence. Before Jesus, nada. Stony silence. 
Jesus was doing something different about men and women's roles from the outset. I'm not surprised he got crucified after three years. What I'm surprised at is that they didn't get around to it sooner. He was a radical Jewish teacher when it came to male and female roles, and it's important to know that. And, you know, for me, one of the big deals is what God was doing in all this. Did you notice that women were last at the tomb, first, last at the cross, first at the tomb, first to see the angels, first to see the risen Lord, first to proclaim the risen Lord? Even John Chrysostom, no great advocate of women, says about Mary Magdalene when she's commissioned by Jesus to go off and tell the boys about what she has just seen, Lo, says Chrysostom, an apostle to the apostles, Mary Magdalene, who'd have thought it? I mean, he's shocked by this. The story was shocking. But the story doesn't get any less shocking with Paul. Sometimes in feminist literature, we have a sort of back to Jesus and away with Paul. He's the bad guy. What I'm trying to show you is that that is absolutely not the case. It's, it's a case of a really bad misreading of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2 that leads to placing Paul with the black hat and Jesus with the white hat and then pitting them against each other when it comes to the roles of women. I don't think it works. Other questions? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Um, what do you think of Gordon Bees and I think a couple others have also made this case about first about that text of First Corinthians 14 being possibly an interpolation. Well, uh, my answer to that is, and Gordon Fee was my teacher, so I <laughs> love Gordon Fee. Um, best teacher I ever had at Gordon Conwell. But uh, I would say that displacement, evidence of displacement, is not evidence of interpolation. There are no manuscripts that I know of that omit 1 Corinthians 14, 32, B to 36. There are some manuscripts that have those verses a little later in the text. But if there's no evidence for omission, there's no evidence for omission. It just means that there was some stream of tradition or some group of scribes who thought that it didn't fit where it is, 32, B to 36 and they moved it. So I, I'm not convinced by the argument of interpolation, and in any case, I don't think it's necessary. He's just correcting a particular problem, and hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the, the text is culturally relativized and therefore of no use to us anymore. If Paul were here today and he were speaking and somebody kept interrupting his speech with about 4,000 questions before he finished, especially if he was in prophetic mode, he would have said, be silent, wait your turn, and since we don't have time for questions, ask somebody at home. I mean, the, the response to the abuse would be the same now as it was then. So I'm not suggesting that these texts are somehow relativized by being problem specific. Obviously, 1 Corinthians is a problem solving letter. This is one more problem, one more fly that Paul had to slot. Yes, sir? Uh, slightly unrelated, but still de dealing with the feminine role. Mm -hmm. um, what is your take on the possible femininity of, like, say, the Holy Spirit or the Shekinah um, dealing with uh, let us make you know, man in, in our image mm -hmm. and people suggesting the femininity of the Holy Spirit to deal with both male and female? Yeah. Um, I think that when Jesus says God is spirit, if we're talking about the divine nature, we need to take that very seriously. The divine nature is neither male nor female, and it can be imaged metaphorically either with male images or female images, and in fact it is in the Old Testament. One of the things that shocked me when I did the math is guess how many times God is called Father in the Old Testament? I mean, there's all of this literature about the patriarchy of the Old Testament, and therefore God was predicated as a father on the basis of Old Testament patriarchy. Guess how many times God is actually called Father in the Old Testament? Four times in 39 books. That's hardly a blip on the radar screen, right? How many times is God invoked as Father in prayer in the Old Testament? two times.
That's all. But when you turn the page to the Gospel of John, there are 145 references to God as Father. You want to know why? It's because of Jesus. We are replicating the language of Jesus. He called God Abba. We are following his example because in his mind, that's the relationship he had with God, that of a son to his father, okay? So the language does not come from the general culture. It comes from us replicating the relationship the son had with the father. That's where it comes from. But the short answer to your question is no, the Holy Spirit is not feminine any more than God the Father is masculine. The, the, both of those kinds of imagery are perfectly appropriate to use of a non-gendered being. You see, it's us who are hung up on the gender thing and wanting to predicate of God either maleness or femaleness. That has more to do with our hang-ups with human sexuality than it does to do with the biblical text itself. Other questions? Yes, sir, way in the back. I'm just curious. It, you mentioned at the very beginning the mm -hmm. esteemed by versus famous among. Yep. Where is that shift? Because just as you were talking, I started looking. And yep. yep. The Latin is among, the German is among, Calvin even says among the apostles. So when does that shift begin? It's latter-day Protestantism freaking out about the growing roles of women in the church and elsewhere. And um, it, it, unfortunately, it's part of the legacy of uh, the King James tradition and the new King James. And um, the um, most recent redo of the RSV as well. Um, that whole tradition really was a response to what was already happening with women and their roles in late Protestantism. And of course, Catholics were happy to bar it as well, since they only have male priests, okay? So, I, you know, it's, it's not there in the Greek. You really can't get there from here with the Greek, but it certainly is there in many of the English translations that are, um, you know, going almost all the way back to Tyndale. So, I mean, that's part of the problem, really. All right, thank you so very much for coming.